Welcome to Coffee with Cornelius. In this episode, we are talking about art, politics, beauty, and philosophy. And if you enjoy this content, please hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see more. My guest today, Michael Pierce, is an artist and professor of figurative drawing and painting at California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks, California. His achievements are considerable, and to be honest, they're too long to list here. If you're interested, he has a Wikipedia page, but I'm just going to give you a sense of his accomplishments. Let me provide you with a few of them. He founded and organizes currently the Representational Art Conference, which started in 2012 and has included keynote speeches by such scholars and eminent figures as Sir Roger Scruton, Odd Nerdrum, and Roger Dean. As a scholar and artist, Michael believes strongly in skill-based art and abhors the trend in much of modern art towards a lack of skill, avant-garde, sophistry, and the like. He is the author of the book, Art in the Age of Emergence from Cambridge Scholars, and is currently working on a new book on avant-garde and quiche called Art and Power. A figurative painter, Michael's own art has been exhibited widely, and he has even painted portraits for popular musicians such as Snoop Dogg, Sea Murder, and Master P. Michael, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me, Cornelius. It's, yeah, so, it's nice to meet you. Me too, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. First of all, tell us a little bit about your book, Art and Power. It's a long book you were mentioning before to me in the, uh, before the program started. Can you tell us what it's about? It, wow. I mean, it's, a, it's an epic book. It's a 200,000 word uh, doorstopper, this thing. So um, uh, I'm in the process of looking for publishers right now uh, and have sent it out to a few. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully we'll get that out there. I'm sure that I'm going to have to cut some pretty big chunks of it out. Uh, it started as an investigation into kitsch. I wanted to understand what kitsch was. And there are quite a few books about kitsch. Um, but I realized that you couldn't really make sense of kitsch uh, by which I mean sentimental art, art that mm -hmm. makes an appeal to, to sentiment, uh, you know, and uh, our empathic connection with the work. Um, you can't so really... So kitsch, uh, j just sorry, a clarifying question. Kitsch is usually used in a derogatory sense. So you're, you don't mean it in a, in a derogatory sense per se, do you? Um, it has been used in a derogatory sense for quite a long time, mm -hmm. about 100 years, uh, almost 100 years. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because sentiment is part of the human condition. We need mm -hmm. kitsch. We, we need sentiment. We, you know, if we didn't have love, how would we survive? Uh, so I don't see that it's truthful uh, to say that kitsch is, uh, is evil and bad and wrong, mm -hmm. which, uh, which philosophers of the 19th, they've been harshly critical of representational art, mainly because of its, uh, its dependence upon sentiment and the empathic connection that one has uh, with the work of art, right? Mm. But, you, but you can't study kitsch on its own because that sentiment is so much part of the human condition without understanding mm. avant-gardism. And because kitsch only really exists in opposition to avant-gardism, what I found myself doing was trying to understand avant-gardism. And what, what, what I is, realized- What is avant-gardism, just for those viewers and listeners of mine who may not have encountered this term before? Well, that's a really good question. You see, mm -hmm. there are many books of theory of avant-gardism, but not so many on the history of avant-gardism. Mm -hmm. And to find the, the history of avant-gardism, you have to go all the way back to about 1800. And you have to read uh, the writings of Simon, uh, who you may have come across, a communist uh, writing uh, mm -hmm. and organizing uh, during, uh, after the French Revolution. Uh, and Saint-Simon was, uh, was a, a, a thorough idealist, utopian idealist, uh, and proto-communist. And he uh, insisted that uh, artists had a very important role uh, in creating the utopian communist uh, society that he imagined. Uh, and he said that uh, artists had to be like the priests uh, of the movement, of the communist movement, uh, and their duty was to create art that supported the movement. In other words, he wanted them to be, uh, to be uh, propagandists. Mm -hmm. He wanted them to serve the movement and uh, subsume their individuality in service to the, revo the proto-communist revolution, as he understood it. Uh, so uh, avant-garde, uh, before Saint-Simon used the term, uh, was exclusively a military term, uh, and the avant-garde were, the, were the, the part of the army that went ahead right. of the main army and negotiated uh, people into surrendering, ideally, uh, uh, skirmished a little bit to clear the way, uh, made sure that the, the engineers would be part of the avant-garde and they would just build the bridges and whatever was necessary. 
And so he equates this, um, uh, this body of artists uh, very much in military terminology. This sounds so, like propaganda to me. It sounds like it's conflating art with politics. I mean, should art absolutely. be conflated with politics at all, in your opinion? Is, isn't art the pursuit of beauty? Uh, well, uh, there's two questions there. I, I don't think art necessarily is the pursuit of beauty. And I'd like okay. to, can we put that over there? And yeah, yeah, sure. Or, I'd really like to do that. Yeah, because uh, it's a really interesting and, uh, mm -hmm. and challenging question. And um, I think it's worth, well worth discussing. Uh, but uh, as far as um, uh, propaganda goes, yes, absolutely. The avant-garde mm -hmm. in its earliest inception was entirely about propaganda. What happens in the course of the 19th century is, is really fascinating too, because you see uh, people like Karl Marx picking up on Saint-Simon's proposal uh, and, and making comments about how art must uh, uh, espouse the communist revolution and how artists must, uh, must serve the revolution. And then, in, uh, then this idea of the avant-garde goes to Russia, where Chernyshevsky picks it up and uh, starts writing. He's a proto-communist uh, Russian revolutionary. Uh, and he uh, ends up in prison. And while he's in prison, uh, he writes a book uh, that starts talking about avant-gardism in Russia. Uh, and this gets picked up in turn by Lenin. Uh, and Lenin thought Chernyshevsky was the most important writer he'd read. It's quite extraordinary that he was reading aesthetics and, uh, and this revolutionary writer and, and credits his revolutionary thoughts to Chernyshevsky. And so mm -hmm. you, what you see is revolutionary propaganda model of the avant-garde being taken to Russia, where eventually it turns into socialist realism. And okay. that's truly, uh, truly uh, avant-gardism in the sense that Saint-Simon meant it. Mm -hmm. In France, uh, you have a different state of affairs. Um, uh, you're an economist, I believe. Uh, that is right. Yeah, I am. Great. So, so um, you know more about this than I, so I hope I don't say something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I may not have a perfect understanding of French economic history, so uh, you know, I may not be able to catch anything. But yeah, please go ahead. So, so you have the Industrial Revolution, and that produces the, the rise of the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as part of, of that rise, what happens is that people have the, uh, the ability to support their children uh, going to college and, uh, and give them uh, allowances. Uh, and uh, there, there appears uh, the bohemian bourgeoisie. Sorry, did you say the bo bohemian? Uh, yes, the okay. bohemians. All right. Bohemians are funded by their wealthy parents. They're nearly always young. Oh. Uh, they, uh, they, they congregate in Paris and they, they get what, uh, um, is it Naval, I forget, one of the French critics calls it the disease of artistism. It's, a, it's so <laughs> <Okay>. wonderful. <laughs> it's just great. They, they all come to Paris and he describes how the disease of artistism infects them and they all have to grow their hair long and they... they <laughs> affected speech and they dress like gypsies and um, and all this which is where the term bohemian comes from by the way sorry w uh, when was this period if i may ask 1820 1830 onwards uh, you start seeing that the, the uh, emergence of the bohemians and this they sounds, still exist today this sounds like the 1960s counter-revolution absolutely mick jagger would have been in paris he would yeah. have loved it yeah, he would have been right there with his, with his, uh, his dead flowers in their ragged company, you know. He would have enjoyed it very much. And so, so this, sorry, happened in the 1820s or 18, 19th century, early yeah, 19th you, century, yeah. Right, you, you got to, uh, Nerval was a, a, a play uh, and uh, this caused a sensation and you start seeing the, 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 the organization of Bohemia uh, based around, uh, around Nerval. And, uh, uh, then from then on, you have this very, very popular movement of young people in Paris. And the, the Bohemians gather in Montmartre and places like that, which are at that time uh, really impoverished, not impoverished, but sort of desolate landscapes, uh, which are being prepared, uh, ready for the, uh, the expansion of Paris into this bourgeois capital under Louis Napoleon, wow. uh, who is the bourgeois emperor, right? Louis Napoleon is a fascinating character, although he has this imperial ambition and imperial authority uh, he he really supports the bourgeoisie he, he's known as the bourgeois emperor mm. uh, and he's written about as the bourgeois emperor by marx which is really interesting uh, and uh, uh, you see 
a, a huge rise in, in prostitution uh, and uh, this sort of the culture of the mistress in, in Paris and a, a decadent kind of life. But at the same time, it's, it's an authoritarian regime. So it's a very confusing... So there's a conflict between these two concepts because they're libertines yeah. on the one hand, on the, on the other hand, they're under an authoritarian dictator. Absolutely. And so the, the avant-garde of Saint-Simon is still going. Mm -hmm. Throughout that century, you have the followers of Saint-Simon uh, who want to overthrow the imperial government. And you see repeated revolutions. There are three or four revolutions uh, over the course of the years. Of, uh, 48 was, um, was a messy one. Um, uh, and uh, so you have this fascinating art scene where you've got these libertine uh, bohemians who are deeply uh, individualist. Mm. Uh, and uh, they, they claim that they revolt against the bourgeoisie, but really they're, they're absolutely tied together. Because <laughs> their parents' <laughs> money, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, are you kidding me? You, you, can't, you can't be serious. Your, your revolutionary zeal is, yeah. is, uh, is artificial. It's kind of fascinating because you, you see that today in the same, you do. same thing happening today. Yeah. You know, I, I was looking at I was just gonna say. thinking of the commune. <laughs> So I've got to ask, just to put this in context, because I know you're a set designer too, and you've done set design, you've gotten awards for your theater design. And just to put this in a context that some of my listeners will be able to relate to, the, these kinds of revolutions and these kinds of revolutionaries, would that be, for example, the type of revolution you see in Les Miserables, you know, the, uh, these young kids who come together and they decide, okay, we're going to overthrow the French government. Is that, is, is that part of it? Is that... Yeah, uh, part that, of the that's, context. That's it right there. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, okay, so, they, so they, what, what happens afterwards with the avant-garde? How does it, you know, go up into the 20th century and beyond? Well, there's this long uh, evolution of it that's um, uh, that's quite extraordinary. So, um, uh, the communist avant-garde uh, goes to Russia. Ideology is going on, uh, and under Louis Napoleon, the the communist avant-garde doesn't stand much of a chance. Except it has this this powerful figure in Courbet, who okay. uh, great painter, uh, mm. and he's a, he's a, he's the first of the, the the socialist realists. And Courbet uh, gets in, gets in, into into intellectually into bed uh, with Proudhon, uh, who of course is this mm. uh, this anarchist. anarchist yeah. Uh, well, to start off with, he's an anarchist, but he wrote a book. The last book he wrote uh, is this uh, principle of art and its, uh, its um, uh, 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 social purpose. And uh, it hasn't been translated into English, which is really odd because it's, mm. it's a rather important book. And so uh, um, uh, Proudhon writes this last book and in it, he expresses these really authoritarian proto-communist ideas. Uh, and so there's this, this, authoritarian, um, uh, dictatorial tirade in the book. It's really quite an extraordinary thing to read, uh, in, in which he demands uh, that artists uh, serve the revolution, serve the communist cause, right? And um, Courbet uh, is corresponding with him. There's some wonderful uh, commentary from Courbet uh, where he describes writing 10 pages a night and sending them to Proudhon. Uh, so he can express his ideas more clearly. And Proudhon commenting uh, on the other side of it to, to Nerval, uh, who's their mutual friend, and on with his political ideas. And so there's this really strange kind of relationship between the two. And uh, uh, one of the things I found interesting about it was that although Courbet embraced Proudhon's uh, communist idealism, uh, he, at the same time, uh, is a rabid individualist. He insists that he, 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 won't even, he won't even set up a school to teach students because he insists that artists must be individualists. Okay, yeah. Right? So, so it, there's this very contradictory thing going on between the two men and, and the ideas. And then Zola, Emile Zola, the, 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 yeah. the great Emile Zola, who I, I, I think is just fantastic, mm -hmm. uh, he, of course, is the champion of individualism. And he writes a response to Proudhon's book uh, the year after it was published, which, by the way, the book did very well. It went into four editions in the first six months of its publication, which is pretty amazing. So this is awful rubbish. Proudhon sucks. Don't <laughs> listen to this guy. <laughs> it's fascinating. 
That's amazing. Oh, goodness, is, yeah. is this tension? So, there seems to be a tension here that you're you're that keeps recurring between these authoritarian tendencies in communism and the I think by nature individualistic aspirations of an artist. Is that very much, true? very much, and and it drives the conflict keeps going and and rules art in the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. Really does because what happens is that uh, after the turn of the century, you get the brew up to uh, World War One mm -hmm. uh, going on in Russia. Of course, you have the revolution brewing up uh, and the uh, the overthrow of the Tsar, uh, and uh, then um, uh, between the wars, you see the rise of Hitler, of course, uh, and in 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 communist Russia and Lenin make absolutely certain that communist uh, art propaganda art is the only art form and in fact they persecute the individualist uh, artists avant-gardists mm -hmm. bohemians out of russia and, mm. and you, you read stories about the individuals like malevich and people like that uh, who are uh, pursuing the breakdown and, and dismantling of art uh, and you see them being hounded out of uh, positions of authority because the communists recognize that the bohemian avant-garde in in that sense is is it is corrupt according to their terms, right? You, you can't be an individualist and be a communist. H.G. Yeah. Uh, Wells interviewed Stalin uh, at one point, and um, Stalin said, uh, no, 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 no. It, it, you can be an individual in the Soviet Union, but that individual must serve the state. And mm. it's a wonderful piece of Orwellian doublespeak, right? Straight out of 1984. Yeah, you can be an individual, but the individual must serve the state. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. It's just terrifying. And so, so you end up with the communist bloc being absolutely governed by Proudhonian and um, Saint Simonian and Chernyshevsky and um, uh, aesthetics uh, with this uh, with this communist avant-garde. Meanwhile, in the West. Uh, you have uh, the American President Roosevelt uh, and Nelson Rockefeller uh, who recognize uh, that they have to do something about art because Hitler is producing his form uh, of uh, realism as propaganda and, and making uh, some uh, really dramatic aesthetic choices, uh, especially with statuary. Uh, as part of the research mm -hmm. for the book, I, I, I looked at every single painting in all of the shows in the, the House of German Art, which was built in Munich. The building's still there to this day. Uh, but the exhibits, um, the paintings, pretty mediocre uh, because mm -hmm. uh, Hit Hitler gave very strict, um, uh, Hitler and Goebbels, I should say, uh, gave very strict instructions about what kind of art could be shown. And it had to always, always basically follow the Nazi principles uh, which were expressed in the Nazi manifesto uh, in 1923, I want to say, uh, and, and remained consistent until uh, they took power. Uh, so basically all art had to follow the Nazi principles. So what he's done is basically take Proudhonian um, and uh, San Simonian ideas and apply them to the National Socialist cause, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's, he's fundamentally using art as propaganda. Uh, Sculpture-wise, uh, it's it's much more interesting art. Uh, it's, it's frightening art, uh, uh, but it's much more interesting. They, it, it's hard to explain it. They, the figures that they made were so muscular and, and so powerful that it, you can get this sense of them trying to overcome ancient Greek and ancient Roman art oh, uh, with their own, yeah, the, the, the sort of Nazi Aryan art. Uh, the, the, the figures are so powerful. They're, they're like, you know Frank Frazetta? Uh, I don't, I'm afraid, of, you know, no. Conan the Barbarian. They're, they're, oh, of course, I know Conan the Barbarian, right. yeah. And the yeah. figures look almost like that. They have muscles on top of muscles. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy, the physique. I see. There's, there's one sculpture of, um, of four or five uh, supermen all pushing a, a boulder up a hill, and the message is very clear. Uh, that this is Sisyphus, and that the Aryan nation is going to support, is going to be able to push that mountain, push the boulder up the mountain. It's, it's to, not a futile it's endeavor. Gonna, it's actually yeah, going to happen. It's going to okay. make it. Yeah. yeah, it's really quite frightening, and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, they're very, very powerful sculptures. Um, uh, they make a very powerful impression. 
uh, aesthetically, uh, the Nazis and the communists were, were far, far ahead in their thinking compared to the United States and, and Britain. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I don't mean ahead as if that's a good thing. I, I, I don't want to give that impression at all. What I mean is they, were, they had a far more developed sense of uh, the use of art mm -hmm. uh, in order to project soft power. Yeah. And so what happens in America in, in um, the Depression in 1930 or whatever year it was, uh, Roosevelt got elected into power. Uh, what you see is he makes a, a preliminary effort uh, to combat that what he sees as this danger in soft power that the Germans uh, and the Russians were, were doing art much, much better than the United States. He kind of imitates being fairly left, or at least catering to the left wing in America. Uh, he uh, introduces socialist re social realism, we called it, uh, in the United States. Uh, but this was problematic because it was so political. It was so p propaganda oriented and uh, skewed to one side of the argument, right? The, the, the sort of proto-communist mm -hmm. socialist side. Uh, and, and that suited him at first, but um, but he realized that he couldn't go on with that. And to 1939, and that's the, that's the crucial year as far as the aesthetics of the United States goes. And in 1939, Roosevelt wraps up the federal art programs. He wraps, he winds them all down. The PWAP, the Public Works of Art Project, continues for a few more years, but that winds down too during the war. Uh, and Roosevelt makes a very firm and very clear commitment to avant-garde art uh, mm. in, in terms of bohemian avant-garde uh, with, uh, with Rockefeller at his side. And Rockefeller has already been using the bohemian avant-garde uh, to transport soft power uh, to South America in this good neighbor policy that he had. Um, and uh, he's exporting uh, modern art, the Parisian school, uh, to South America and using it as a projection of American soft power. Roosevelt embraces that and makes the uh, famous speech. Uh, in 1939, uh, the uh, Museum of Modern Art, is uh, sec its second building is opened up. and Roosevelt gets on the radio in a one-hour presentation and basically says, listen, this is American art. Modern art is American art. This is what we do here. And he gives it state support. Uh, he encourages modern art, centers everywhere, promoting modern art and uh, the, the uh, individualism of that kind of avant-garde. Right? And it's, uh, it's basically uh, the art of the, the New York Brahmins, the, the, mm. the, the, the liberal elite. Yeah. And uh, they, they have power over art from then on in the United States. And it continues that way until about 1958 when television takes over. In 1958, over 80% of American households buy TV. And so art becomes much less important uh, in the projection of soft power. It goes to television and radio much more at that point. So it would appear then, from what you're saying, that the avant-garde is not an organic development. It's very much tied to political power and political patronage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you, it, it's impossible to untie them. And uh, I, I find it ironic, you know, you, you talk to um, art professors uh, and they imagine that they're individual, they're, they're, um, they're you know, uh, serving their own purpose and all that. They're not. They're part of the, the liberal elite establishment. And so there's, there's very little revolution going on in, in, uh, <laughs> in that kind of Yeah, art. sure. They're kidding themselves. And I think it would be interesting for them to 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 see that and see what it does in their work because um, it is in service to the state. In a sense, isn't that inevitable in a way? And what I mean by that is this: uh, artists at some point need patrons. Uh, those patrons right. are are never going to be unbiased. They're never going to be apolitical, or you know, I I don't think they yeah. will be anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I you're mean, exactly right. So, the artists are always in service to somebody. That, yeah. You know, if, uh, if um, you're an artist trying to make a living, you, mm -hmm. you have to get someone to pay the bills. We're, we're always the, uh, the servants of someone. Uh, and, uh, and if not capital, then we're in service to the, the liberal elite uh, that uh, pays the bills. Yeah, absolutely. You get a government grant, who, who are you getting paid by? If you're getting a government grant, you're part of the establishment. Yeah, once you, once you start to do the, that and you fall down that hole... Um, but you have a particular problem with avant-garde art. Is that fair to say? No, not really. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Zola's oh, okay. avant-garde. Oh, you I'm do? A, okay, uh, right. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm a big fan of individualism. 
I, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to propaganda. I think that propaganda is pretty vile. Yeah. Uh, I'm opposed to uh, the, the subsumation of the individual by the state. I think that's pretty vile. I agree. Uh, I think the, the, the individual is very important if you're going to have a true uh, democracy in the sense of American democracy. That's what it, that's what it says. Us. Mm-hmm. You know, all men are created equal, but, it, but the Constitution doesn't make um, any other promises than we want the pursuit of happiness, not happiness. That's right. The pursuit of happiness, you, yeah. Yeah. You make your own happiness. You, that's up to you. Right in in the United States, and uh, so I, I think uh, the individual is is um, is paramount here. It, it has to be. So yeah, I'm not I'm not opposed to uh, the ex- self expression uh, and the uh, the um, art that's made by individuals, uh, and and probably uh, now we should get back to beauty because uh, yeah yeah I'd like to yeah yeah art, art can be beautiful. It doesn't mean it should be beautiful doesn't mean it has to be. So, so before we do that, can you just clarify, do you believe that there is an objective beauty, an objective standard of beauty we can judge art no, by? No, no. Um, in, in World War II, um, Heinrich Himmler mm-hmm. uh, set up uh, at Dachau uh, a, a porcelain factory. Okay. This is a, a, this is a, a, a weird dissonance for me that you've got so this uh, labor camp uh, mm. where people are literally being worked to death and uh, terrible typhoid epidemics and lack of food and all that. Uh, and right next door, you've got this, um, you've got this factory making truly beautiful scul- uh, sculptural mm-hmm. pieces and decorative art uh, uh, funded by Heinrich Himmler, uh, who's the leader of the SS, right? And yeah. so, uh, what, what's remarkable about this, uh, the, and in the research that I did for the book, I found that uh, Himmler was, I mean, who's a total asshole psychopath, He's the, <laughs> the course, most heinous yeah. evil man you could ever think of, you know. Yeah. But, but he has this this sentiment uh, going on for for dogs and, and deer and things like that. And the porcelain that uh, that the Alak factory made was exquisite. Mm. It's absolutely exquisite. You, you know, some of the stuff you look at and you can't say that this is not beautiful. That it's made by an SS uh, by the SS uh, leader. Uh, for the SS, because he required the SS to buy his officers to buy this art. Mm. It's heinous. So, so I, I, what what I found was that you cannot equate beauty with moral goodness. You just can't. How can you get there? I, I, I sure. it impossible to get there. I, I would agree but, with that. I, I don't. I, you know, they are these three transcendentals that are supposed to be part of a classical education: goodness, truth, and beauty. And you're probably right. Beauty may be lower than truth or goodness, but nonetheless, could there be an objective? It seems like when you're talking about truly beautiful and truly uh, exquisite art, you are appealing to an objective or a universal, at least, standard of beauty. Is that fair to say? I guess in the platonic sense, you know. Yeah, in the platonic sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, if if. Um, all things that we make are in, in imitation of the one, then, then yeah, the one is the source of actual pure beauty. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but uh, are, you, are you truly behind that, uh, that idea? I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with, uh, with platonic idealism. Okay. Why not? I, I, that's a difficult question. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a big question. Um, I talked my way out of Christianity. Mm-hmm. It took me about 25 years to, to get there. I went to a Christian boarding school uh, in England, and um, uh, we were thoroughly indoctrinated with uh, Christian Methodist and Anglican principles every day. Every Oh, every day. I'm sure you were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It took me a long time to talk my way out out of um, you know, the text and uh, learning about biblical history and uh, all that. Um, so I find myself feeling rather ambivalent about the idea uh, of the universal mind in some ways. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have an ob- objection to the emergent universal mind. I, I have an objection to the universal mind being up there and projecting uh, outward. Mm-hmm. I think the universal mind is the other way around. I think the universal mind is everything and everything goes inward. Everything goes upward and outward, not not downward. Do you see what I mean? 
Uh, not really. What, what does that mean, an emergent I, universal mind? I'm not expressing mind? myself very well. So emergence is the idea yeah. that, um, that... Have you ever seen a, a, a murmuration of, of starlings? Um, so uh, could you repeat that? Where, uh, uh, like a flock of, of starlings. When you see oh, yes, so, yeah, of course, yeah, they, I see it. And they do all these... these well, the, the swirling elegance of a murmuration uh, is impossible for one bird to perform. Mm -hmm. and, it, and no single bird governs that murmuration. Sure. It's, it's like people call it the hive mind, right? Yeah. There's this, um, this uh, um, conglomeration of individuals to make one mind. And oh, that's, I see. What I, okay. that's what I mean yeah. by, by the emergent uh, one mind. Uh, that, that if everything in the universe has a, a vibration and, and however you define consciousness, uh, then that, that immense vibration creates the one mind rather mm -hmm. than the one mind being something separate from us at the center of all things and projecting the ideals. That sounds like, a, I want to say, kind of an Eastern concept or Dharmic concept of, of the one it, it, mind. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. I think, I think that's, uh, that's uh, probably what you're right, yeah. But even within that framework, couldn't there still exist a, an objective standard of beauty? I mean, or would you say that to the extent that this, this emergence vacillates and changes, this mm -hmm. concept of beauty will vacillate and change along with that emergence? Yeah. Is that what yeah, you would absolutely. say? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you yeah. see that when you look at the, the rope of history, you know, the, yeah. I, I like to think of time and, and history being like a rope. So, yeah. So, you know, history is the road that's behind us and, and these different ideas in the braiding of, of uh, history uh, rise and fall and come mm. into the light uh, as as time passes. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And, um, I, I do think that beauty uh, changes according to the time. It seems to it seems beauty seems to be a consistent thing that we seek. And yet uh, the our appreciation of it seems to alter uh, as time passes. Is that a quality of the sort of collective mind or collective conscious that you describe, or is that just a problem with people's tastes? Are people's tastes uh, diminishing over time or are they ascending over time? You know, is, is, is that something that I, I could explain it? I don't believe in progress. I don't All think right, yeah. progress is real, you know, th and that's where you're leading to, I think, with this, I, with this question. Yeah, well, uh, not even necessarily progress, but maybe even cycles of progress and descent. Right, and yeah, yeah. there may be, yeah. I think we, for every advance, we seem to have a failure. You know, I, I don't true, think yeah. there's universal progress. It just, history is not a progression. It doesn't work like that. Some mm. things in the, in the Middle Ages were fantastic, uh, and we've lost them. Uh, the Renaissance, you know, we, uh, and um, uh, I don't see that that's a, a progressive evolution. Yeah, the Renaissance is my favorite period in art. It, I think it was beautiful in, in, a, in every way possible. Mm. Um, mm. And yet it would seem that, you know, much of the Renaissance art is religious art, right? Whenever I look at, whenever I look at art that really uh, manages to take me beyond myself, it always seems to have a religious theme, whether that's pagan in the case of Greek statues, um, or it's it's Christian in in the Renaissance art, or even Hindu in in the art of mm. the of the temples of India, um, mm. doesn't that point towards uh, a transcendence that is beyond our collective minds, though? Uh, you know, yeah, kind sure of a Platonic does. thing, yeah. Even. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. sure does. We 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 hunger for the one. You know, as individuals yeah. within the one, we hunger to be complete. Mm -hmm. uh, we want we want to be uh, we want to be part of the one mind and understand our, our being part of that one mind being the one mind the whole one mind, which mm -hmm. is impossible. <laughs> yeah, course. sure. Yeah, it's impossible in the context of of material life, and yeah. um, w so um, at the same time, you are a big proponent of skill based art, right? What does that yeah, mean? Absolutely. Skill based art. Um, as part of the, uh, the 20th century uh, adoption of, of the individualist avant-garde by America, John Dewey's philosophy uh, dominated art practice. And uh, what John Dewey was uh, the proponent of was uh, individual expression. He believed that everyone's, mm -hmm. everyone's experience was of equal validity uh, yeah. and, that, and that art should be all about the individual's expression of self. 
And that's fine, uh, but, um, but along the way, he threw out any interest in classical training. Because uh, I'm, as, as I've said, I'm a big fan of individualism, but I think individualism is best expressed when you have a framework of technical mastery, so that mm. what you're doing is really fantastic. Sure. Because, you know, you, you, you said uh, in the, uh, the preamble, we were, uh, you commented that uh, you and your wife had gone to a museum and uh, that you saw all this terrible art on the walls. At the National and, Gallery uh, of Canada, in fact, in Ottawa. It was, it was atrocious. Some stuff uh, I, I can't even describe to you because I don't know what it was, to be quite frank. It was, it was a puzzle to me. And I think a lot of people have this feeling, though, you know, not just me, but people who uh, consider themselves to be Philistines, they go into these... Uh, these big galleries like the London Gallery or, or the National Gallery in Canada. And we see these paintings which have no skill that they could have been drawn by monkeys as far as we can tell. And we think, are, am I supposed to appreciate this? Is this supposed to move me in some way? Is this supposed to make me feel like I'm part of the transcendence? Is, is that is that a you're, Philist you're a yeah. terrible you're a terrible philistine yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah I'm but, but from the point yeah. of view of the avant-garde yeah. we are we are because i sure, have the yeah. same feeling and always have i go yeah. to the, the, the you know the modern art gallery and, uh, and i look at a lot of the art and i think god this is awful it's yeah awful. but but now now here's the thing though it, is it, it is it a genuine form of self-expression Jackson Pollock splashing mm. paint around. That, yeah. Sure, that's self-expression. Is it skilled? Is it admirable? I, I don't think so. No. No. Does it fulfill the liberal elite propaganda agenda? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because they can sell. Pro they can sell uh, Jackson Pollock as as an individualist. It doesn't I see. matter. It, it, the, the arts crap. It doesn't matter. Yeah. He's an example of individualism. And it's no coincidence that Life magazine is in the Rockefeller building. You know? Mm. He's pro floors below Nelson Rockefeller's offices. Yeah. They're buddies. He's the landlord. They're hanging out together. They're going to the same Groton cocktail parties. And, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's that, that same uh, East Coast elite that dominates art in the 20th century. And that's why we've got the art that we've got today. It, and it still goes on. The stockbroker who spending a hundred million dollars on a painting here, two hundred million on a painting there, and propping up the, the sort of legendary status of this kind of modern art. But, mm. but who does he represent? He's he's absolutely a one percent elitist yeah. member of the liberal uh, American ruling class. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, th there's no class struggle going on today. Wait, I, I actually, I would like to ask you about that. Is is that really true? Because you see these phrases like the one percent, and you know, in the wake of things like Occupy Wall Street, and it, even right. with what's going on now with uh, these protests, perhaps I'm not sure. I, I you know don't really like to follow it too much because it makes me pretty depressed. But um, it, it seems like there is a, an emerging class consciousness. Um, in the United States, not not so much in Canada, but you know, you 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 notice you look at the the people who vote for for populists like Trump or Bernie Sanders. They seem to be uh, a a group of disenfranchised uh, young people or or middle aged people who seem to have been sold this vision of the American dream and and haven't 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 fulfilled it in their own lives or right. haven't been given the opportunity to fulfill it in their own lives. Isn't that a class struggle? fundamentally it, it's uh, i don't think it is i think mm. that uh, i bought i bought this uh, the the answer <laughs> no because, way all right yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to understand what answer are all yeah. about and um, uh, you know something scary when this yeah. book arrived i buy a lot of books off of amazon right? lots mm -hmm. of books and when this book arrived i had to sign for it okay isn't that isn't that a little chilling that you have to sign for a book I've never had to sign for a book before. And yeah, me neither. Yeah, I just that, they just put it on the on the doorstep and you're done. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I, I found that quite disturbing. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so so yeah, reading that this is this is a Marxist book. He, he's mm -hmm. he's thoroughly class struggle Marxist. But but Antifa are the black bloc. You know, they they they're the militant part of this um, of this struggle. Uh, and uh, I think when you look at things like what, you know, you have a couple of murders go down and everyone goes home. Because these, these folks who are protesting, I think quite a lot of them are, are, 
They're cosplay revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have any structure to replace uh, the, the structures that they say uh, they're struggling against and want to get rid of. In fact, they're all using thousand dollar cell phones to communicate mm -hmm. and participating in capitalism. It goes back to Guy Debord and the Society of the Spectacle, I think. You know, have you, have you read that book? That's really I haven't, no, I really haven't, yeah. He, he's a Marxist writer. Uh, he wrote in uh, 1984, I think. Uh, he was there in 68 in the Paris uh, student uprising. Uh, and then uh, he uh, shot himself. And basically what he says in the commentary is that you can do to fight against that capitalist spectacle. You, you can't revolt against cap capitalism by using the same tools that capitalism provides. Okay. And that's what I think is happening today. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a Interesting. political guy, but that seems to be what's going on. It's kind of fascinating. And it, is there any art in it? I don't see any art at all. There's no art in this book at all. He doesn't there's no art in Antifa. Art. They are no. des destroying art. They're destroying monuments. What I was surprised is recently a statue of Frederick Douglass, who was, uh, yeah, yeah. A, you know, who was an African American abolitionist, yeah. came yeah. down or was desecrated, uh, and it, and it just uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, you know, I I'm not opposed necessarily to taking down statues, uh, but in a civil society, I think you do that by uh, the, the normal means, right? You do that by petitions, by going to your mm -hmm. town council saying, you know, this guy was a Confederate soldier, or this guy supported slavery. You know, let's take his statue down. Uh, but I, I but, think there are, there are some difficult yeah. issues with that, though, Cornelius. You know, yeah. A lot of these statues are, are clearly racist asshole statues. Absolutely. Put up they in, are. You yeah. know, and uh, they, they don't belong anywhere in America. Uh, yeah. I run the representational art group on Facebook, and mm -hmm. uh, I get it. I, it's so funny. I get beat up in that group uh, by people who think I'm a Republican and beat up by people who think I'm a Democrat. <laughs> I, can't, I can't win. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I, I try to keep it nonpartisan yeah. as much as possible, because otherwise it just devolves into a, a, a slinging match and there's no conversation. Right? Uh, but um, one of the things that I've noticed in there is that uh, there, there do truthfully seem to be some. Confederate war memorials that, that are probably uh, appropriate. Some, uh, uh, most of them are not. Most of them mm -hmm. were put up in the in the uh, Jim Crow yeah. years, and uh, this is white territory, you mm -hmm. know, and it's disgusting. And take the damn things down. The trouble with it is it costs a lot of money to take a statue down, and nobody wants them. Yeah. No one wants them. No one. And so what do you do with these? Also, there are issues of ownership because people paid for those statues. The, the Daughters of the Confederacy apparently uh, own quite a lot of these statues and mm. they don't want their statue taken down. So uh, I'm, I'm in favor of tearing down some of these statues because they're disgusting. Just mm -hmm. get, them, get them down. Yeah, no, the Confederate don't. statues are pretty horrible. I agree oh, with they're you there. Yeah. Awful. Just, just awful. Yeah. And, but then there are more nuanced and subtle ones. Uh, uh, they they want to tear down the um, uh, the uh, uh, Roosevelt statue at yeah. the Natural History Museum. And, um, and I, I see their point, you know, monumental sculpture is that monumental sculptures are, are supposed to be there in, in perpetuity, right? Mm. You put them up there as symbols uh, in perpetuity. And, and, uh, when our society changes, that, that idea that's expressed by the sculpture doesn't resonate anymore. And Roosevelt in his day, uh, probably, I don't know much about his history, um, the first Roosevelt. Uh, uh, he's an interesting guy and probably I should study him and learn about him more. Uh, but in his day, uh, I guess people perceived him as being uh, in company with, uh, with uh, with uh, the Native American and the, and the black guy who are beside him, right? But he's on a horse, so he's obviously superior. So take it down, put it somewhere else, somewhere that's not so prominent. And besides, what's he got to do with natural history? Yeah. I uh, don't get it. Do you, do you support a kind of civil taking of it down, though? Or would you say that it's okay to sort of tear them down in a... In, I, I think right? that when, when you've got Confederate statues in, mm -hmm. in Richmond or, or in... Uh, in uh, oh, I don't know, Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. Just if the if the city government isn't acting fast enough and getting it down, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, I have a lot of sympathy for them going and tearing down some of these statues. I have no sympathy for people tearing down a statue of Frederick, Frederick Douglass because mm -hmm. because it's done in ignorance. Yeah. That, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. 
that's a that's a foolish thing to do and and that speaks to me about uh, a contempt for the past mm. and i think that's a mistake uh, the there's um we have an agreement with the people of the past with our ancestors right yeah we do and the, the the agreement is that we're going to we're going to carry on and we're going to take the things from the past that are good and valuable and that's worthwhile right. and continue with them. and and so i think by by just wanting destruction and ignorance and and uh obliterating the past for no good reason we're not honoring that agreement mm -hmm. and i think that's uh, that's shameful actually. i agree that's a sort of burkean conservative sentiment and i think that's an accurate uh, sentiment and an accurate inclination to feel uh, that you mentioned ignorance and something that i've noticed in my own university career is you know when i went to entered university i started to take these art history courses i really enjoyed it actually i think art has a fascinating history and you know it, it's actually quite a break compared to most history courses because you actually get to look at stuff you don't just read right you get to actually look right. at at paintings and statues and and it kind of takes your mind out of just the uh, drudgery of reading a textbook um but uh, I do think that it's important. Most people aren't going to go on to university. They're going to you know, be in the public school system. It's important, perhaps, for students to have some sense of this, this past, you know, the good things in our past that the artists have created. How would you change the public school system, let's say in California, or it, which is perhaps something that you're better acquainted with, uh, how would you change it so that students are put in touch with uh, great works of art from the past? That's a, that's a challenging question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know entirely. It's mm -hmm. such a big issue. Uh, art history should be more, more globally inclusive, I think, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Uh, it tends to focus uh, intensely upon the, the classical tradition and the mm -hmm. Renaissance and European art history. Um, uh, so yeah, it should be much more globally mm -hmm. uh, inclusive. But I, I don't teach art history. You know, I've written an mm -hmm. art history book, but I don't teach art history. I teach philosophy of art, mm -hmm. uh, which is that's really fun to teach. I really enjoy teaching that class uh, because it does address questions, and uh, and I encourage the students to make up their own minds about things. And uh, we have really interesting conversations in that class, mm -hmm. which challenge me as much as, it cha as hopefully it challenges them. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't know if I'm I'm terribly comfortable in trying to address the the big question of art history. In terms of skill based art, I think that uh, we could make a huge difference uh, to uh, the way that we teach art by introducing more uh, more traditional skill uh, and uh, encouraging students to get a skill set that actually might help them get a job. Sure, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, being an individualist avant-gardist, boy, the employed, unemployment rates are high, you know, and, and you wouldn't you wouldn't have bridge engineers uh, or, or uh, skyscraper builders and encourage them to uh, radical individualism, would you? Because they're skyscrapers. No, of course them, not. Would that would be terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. why would you expect yeah. someone to, to come out of an, of an avant-gardist uh, education and, and suddenly be able to draw and make animation and, uh, and do the incredible things that are being done in movie making these days uh, or, or in animation? You know, it's... A, Oh, that's a great point, actually. That's a brilliant point you make because, um, you know, I, there has to be a structure to everything that is good, I think, and even everything that's beautiful. It's it, Someone gave me this analogy. It's like a basketball game. It has rules. And within those rules, uh, once you master those rules, you you can be free and you can be really free and you can have a fun and enjoyable game if if you follow the rules. But if you if you don't, if you just do whatever you want on the basketball court, nobody has it's fun. Chaos. It's, yeah. 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 And I think I think that this uh, this goes to something really important about individualist expression. That if you try uh, to be a, a full on anarchist in, in terms of creativity, you'll produce mm -hmm. garbage. It's yeah. going to be garbage. If you create a set of constraints voluntarily, you mm -hmm. know, you accept a set of constraints. Then, then you have to come up with ideas. You're forced to come up with these clever ways of, of negotiating those, those mm. kind of constraints. And that's when you start seeing really brilliant art. That's exactly yeah. when you see it. It's fascinating.
I agree. Um, you mentioned that art should be more globally inclusive, and I would I would agree with that. I don't think people get a sense of the great art of uh, of Africa or China or in India or other countries no. unless it's more globally inclusive. But should art be should art training be more disciplined? Should artists be disciplined in the way they approach? their own imaginations, you know, should they try to tame their imaginations in, in, in a way that uh, is, I guess, conducive with skill-based training? Should they learn a canon of art before they, they embark on their own experiments? And should they learn that canon very well? I, I think it's certainly helpful mm -hmm. uh, to, to understand what's gone before, right? You, mm -hmm. you really need to know what's gone before. I'm a big fan of emulation. Mm -hmm, emulation, yeah. it's not imitation. Emulation is when you, you take what's been done in the past, that like the conservative contract we talked about earlier on, mm -hmm. that you take what's been done in the past and you apply it to your own work and try to exceed uh, what's been done in the past and do it better. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I think, is really worthwhile. Do it better than it's ever been done before. That's, that's worth going for. And that's what I would uh, recommend. Fantastic. Well, we're getting towards the end of the interview now. Um, where can we find you and your artworks, Michael? Uh, you have a web page, I believe, and you also have a YouTube channel, right? So could you just plug those for us, oh, please? I, I, don't, I don't have a YouTube Oh, you don't? Okay. Um, uh, on my website, uh, it's called, uh, you'll find http colon slash slash gildedraven.com. Gildedraven.com. Gildedraven, I like that. <laughs> it's a Humphrey Bogart reference. It's yeah. a Maltese, Fal Maltese Falcon. Right? <laughs> I've had it for a very long time. I'm not sure why I chose Gilded. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great movie. Time. It's a great movie, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. True. I, I love all that noir stuff. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you can find a lot of my stuff there at Gilded Raven. And you also have a YouTube video about imaginative realism, right? And uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, we made a 15-minute film about imaginative realism based on a show that I, uh, I put together about a year ago. Um, I noticed that there was something happening uh, in American art, which was really interesting. Uh, the, what, what, was going, what I noticed was that there was a new, new genre of art, a new kind of art, that was being made that was being absolutely ignored in, uh, in art history. It wasn't being paid attention to in the slightest. Uh, it came out of the fantasy art of the 1970s. And it actually has much deeper roots than that. It goes way back in time, uh, in fact. Uh, but uh, you've got a lot of artists these days who are making imaginative realist art, which I think is truly democratic and truly uh, mm -hmm. American in its character. You just don't find it elsewhere in the world. And it's the, it's the art that uh, feels comfortable in science fiction and fantasy movies. And uh, it's, the, it's that kind of world. It's an, it looks like it could be real, but can't be real, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's realist in the sense that it looks like it should actually be, but it's not. And, and I think it, it has a lot in common with superhero movies uh, and that kind of fantasy science fiction kind of a world yeah yeah and there are a lot of people making this kind of art these days and, and it's really really good I, I like it very much it appeals to my 17 year old self yeah sure yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely plug that video i watched it, it was a great video so uh, oh, i'll do, plug yeah, yeah i'll put both your website and that video on my description box so thank you so much michael for joining me i really enjoyed our discussion well my pleasure thanks for having me cornelius i'll, I'll see you on the web